obviously uh, um, every new book is uh, for for an author is um, an important book but there is something very personal to this book because it is connected to my past uh, way back to uh, I was young also in this incarnation and I went to Israel first time in 69 as a member of a band called Daisy on a three month tour and um, little did I know that this would be a trip that really really turned everything upside down for me and we were playing in Nazareth in Bethlehem in Jerusalem and suddenly it dawned on me that we were actually in the places where Yeshua or Jesus uh, the whole story about everything New Testament and so forth and on our free days or our day off we were always taken out to some place where to see something as tourists so we were taken one day to Qumran at the Dead Sea where the, this to this day still is uh, uh, some ruins of the former Essene uh, not monastery but university and we were taken there and the guide he was starting to to tell about where the different things were the, this room was the scrollery and this room was where they were dining and this room was for meditating and so forth and suddenly i heard myself say no it was actually over there that the scrollery was and over there was the meditation room and then everything stopped of course because the, everybody looked at me as i was crazy because and I did not know myself how wh where those words came from. Lucky for me, and what really made a difference, was that just right behind me was a German professor who was there to to study the Essenes. He was uh, uh, into the Dead Sea Scrolls and sudden, and he said, "I think the young man is right." And then the tour stopped. You know, the, I think the guide he lost his. Uh, his touch and everything so but to me that was really really something I knew from that moment I was connected to that place I felt like this was totally home for me and um, ever since that time I have been going back to Israel again and again and again and um, some years back i visited that cave number four you know there's 11 caves from in which the dead sea scrolls were found but only one was man-made and that is the the cave that today co is called number four and it is very very close to the university so i started to to think this place were, were were used for other things than just hiding uh, manuscripts so um, but what was the, it all about so one day i climbed up there and uh, it was one of the most uh, powerful experiences i have ever had with a, a so-called spiritual place uh, it was not because there was any apparitions or uh, epiphanies or anything at that time it was just this feeling of being neutralized or nullified you could say it was like coming into a place where there's such a calm you know i would not even say it there was no spirituality there was no it was just this wow it was like a a, a, a space in between what you would call heaven and earth it was like and i later found out that it was actually the place where the essenes were practicing one of their their most important initiation 40 days in the desert and i knew all about that from my studies into their aramaic language what that meant you know and i found out that this was the place where Yeshua most possibly and John the Baptist have uh, sat for 40 days doing that 40 days uh, or um, the Essenes actually called it um, chariot of fire 
You might have heard it if you were into the Kabbalistic thing, you would know about the, the chariot of fire. You can read about it in the book of Ezekiel, the, uh, the second book of Kings in the Old Testament, uh, where uh, Elijah also um, travels to heaven in his chariot of fire. But the chariot of fire is just a metaphor for a, um, a practice where you actually go into a meditative state and in the end if you are if you if you um, do it properly you leave your body and you you reach higher uh, levels of consciousness and that was exactly what this was all about then i also at one time uh, i had when i visited that that place i read in a book about um um, about um, Helen Schuchman, you know, the scribe who was doing the, the Course in Miracles. Her friend, uh, Kenneth Vapnik, who helped her um, in, um, the, in, in spreading the news about the, the Course in Miracles, once took her to Israel. And at that time in 1969, when I was in Israel, she actually had a vision in New York about a cave in which there was a scroll and she in the vision she opened the scroll and when she opened it it said God is and she was told if she opened it to the left she would be able to connect to her past or the past in, in you know in in general and if she opened to the right she would be uh, she would be uh, connected to the future but in the vision she decided not to do anything just look at meditate on God is and she was actually told you have chosen the right path because and she was taken to Israel and when they visited this cave not in in the cave but she was standing outside looking up at the cave she started to cry and mind you, Helen Schuchman, as was told by her friends and Kenneth Wapnick in the book, she was not a, a woman of feelings. She never showed any feelings. She was very pragmatic and very, you could say, um, intellectual minded. But she started to cry and she, she pointed at the cave and she said, that is the cave for my vision. This is actually the holiest place on earth. And when I visited that cave the third time, I had an intuition brought me to read that in that book, uh, that Kenneth Webber, and I found that place and I thought, wow, I could see from picture that that was the cave I had been visiting, the cave number four. So that even made it very so much stronger. So I was invited to, to be part of a documentary film in Israel about the Aramaic language, and that is what this book is centered all about that trip and before i went there i had a reading from uh, a good friend of mine and a very very uh, skilled uh, seer the well seer carol clark and in the reading she, she told me last there is something i need to tell you you need to go to a certain cave because there you will, if you know what to do when you come to that game, you will be connected to your past and your future. And I was immediately thinking about what happened to, to Helen Schuchman when she had this vision. And when I got that message from Carol Clark, I knew what I had to do and I knew the cave I had to visit. So I thought, this is not accidental that I'm invited to be part of this movie. So I knew that when we were going, I would ask the crew to, to take me to go with me to the cave and I would do this, uh, this uh, practice, the chariot of fire practice, which you can hear. Um, it is the Bishem Adonai. Um, Ameni Michael practice that I've done. I think you can find it on on YouTube also, or if you can go to to um, you can see me in the cave that we, I'm talking about, and it's called the video is called the Gate of Light. But anyway, 
some of the very, very um, important experiences I made while doing that, and that I want to share with you here now, because there have been a lot of talk about in Kabbalistic um, uh, new spirituality. How, how do you go about the chair of fire? How do you actually go into this uh, uh, position where you can leave the body and reach higher dimensions? And how can you, con what, why will you, would you want to do it? And I knew what I wanted to do with it. I wanted to connect to the book of life. I wanted to try to get in touch with information that I knew would be uh, waiting for me, as it will be for anybody who is connecting to the Book of Life. Before all this happened, I had been working with my teacher, the seer, for many years, and he was uh, able to connect to the to the the Book of Life and get information there as easy as just like this. Um, so I knew from my work with him that what I should be uh, attentive about. And I knew that every time you try to put yourself into what is in the New Testament called an unprotected state, because that is what it, we are told in the New Testament when Yeshua went into his 40 days in the desert. It actually means you put yourself into an unprotected state. And that means that you leave the intellect. If you are able to put yourself in a situation where you can leave the, or, or you can just leave it behind, so to speak, or, or leave it outside the cave or outside the room you now go into where you want to practice the, the chair of fire. If you can leave all this behind, your personality, so to speak, this is the hard part because when you are receiving information, it will always be filtered through your personality and all your own personal noise, so to speak, your problems and so forth. So of course, it's important to know how can you get, how can you leave this outside? How can you leave all these things outside? And the seer actually did that every day because he was not a man without problems, of course. He was human being. But he somehow, from a very early on in his life, was connected to or able to, to go over that threshold and leave his personality outside his office every morning. And just for an hour, he would heal people all over the world or help them with this problem or that problem. And afterward, he would go out and he said, don't worry. All your problems will wait for you outside. They, they won't run away and nobody would would steal it from you. So so he was able to go out and take, of course, everything upon him and start to work with her, his personal problem like everybody else. My problem, and probably a lot of other people's problems doing that, is that I was I did not have the ability to just do like that and 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 just tread over that treasure. So that is why you do the practice. Any spiritual practice is actually there to purify you and to kind of get you out of the, the room of noise or, or somehow disconnect you from that just for a moment when you are doing this practice. So that was what happened to me in the cave. And uh, I knew from, from my um, days in, in showbiz that when you perform, that is performance and you can put on a, a costume and an attitude and you, you, that's it, you know, and that's, that can be beautiful too, but you connect in another way. Here I knew that when there was a camera in the cave, it, my problem would be to kind of forget all about that. And I knew that that would take time. So I spent the, uh, a lot of time just going into the process of just getting into the center of my very being through the practice, the Bishem Adonai that I was singing. I could not bring a, a musical instrument, so I just had a tambourine. And that made, didn't make it any easier. 
But anyway, it took me approximately one hour. And at that time, I was totally gone. I don't know what happened in the cave, and I just totally forgot about it. And the only thing I can say what I was connected to was to um, way back to my 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 past as an any scene because I had a strong feeling that I was a scribe in at the Essene community at that at, at the time of Yeshua. And uh, Kelle had said yes, you he always called me the scribe. So he said yes, that's that's true, you you were part of the Essenes. So that is another thing that if you have a strong feeling about you yourself who are watching this, that you're connected to some tradition, whatever it might be, you will probably have a connection. And, and also if you, as me, for 30, 40 years have been very much working with that tradition, trying to get into it, get, get connected to it again, um, through study and through practice. Yeah, I would also say you should pursue that because that that would could easily be your your connection to the information that awaits you uh, in the Book of Life. So I had this feeling of being surrounded by some of my former Essene brothers uh, from that time when I was doing that. So I was more or less connected to them or to, you could say, to the vibration of the brotherhood. So it was, I felt very purified afterwards and I felt, I was so high after it. But of course I did not know what, what had taken place in the cave. But that was another story that you can read in the book also and maybe also see in the, the video uh, from, from, the, from the practice. But a lot of things started to happen and after that also for I think for the next week or something afterwards I I was so connected to these information that start to come in also in my dreams at night and um, I we were at one time I were going to to um, to to visit Bethany and that was after the the crew after the filming and everything and the crew had went home and I, ha I wanted to stay one week more so I had done uh, preparation for staying different time and I went to Jerusalem and I, um, I went to Bethany and maybe you remember Bethany was where Jeshua always were going to visit Mary and the Magdalene and her sister Miriam, Martha and he, their brother Lazarus and it's a very special place there so somehow, and that is very interesting for me, if you have read the old manuscript, maybe you remember in my book, the Mary, the Mary Magdalene and the Grey Book, I'm actually connected to my feminine, my feminine aspect or the feminine aspect within me that suddenly through the whole, my whole life I have had different names and suddenly working with the Mary Magdalene book I'm suddenly connected to a certain aspect and to me it was as I write it in the book there's a metaphor for it where I, I in, I'm transported to a certain room and a, and a sofa where in the one end of the sofa uh, a young girl is sitting and I, in the in the vision, I'm sitting at the other end of the sofa and I'm having a conversation or a connection to her. Now, in this, in the light within a human heart, she suddenly comes back um, uh, and it's all metaphorical. But to me, it was, I had this feeling when I came to Bethany that, so I don't know if the, if the first time or the second time, uh, when I visited, and I'm writing this in the book, but there is a time, kind of time, um, um, what do you call it? Suddenly, I experienced that a few days later when I visited Bethany, everything is changed. It's like there was, when I visited this building the first time, there was a total new building 
at, uh, at that uh, site where I was visiting, and suddenly the second time I come, there's an old building there, you know, and, and I'm so confused, you know, and I tried to visit some of the places I visited two days before, but it is all changed. People I've talked to kept, don't re remind, they don't remember me, you know, people I've talked to, they look through me like I'm, so this was really, really weird, you know, because I've never tried it that way before. But later on, when I worked with it and meditated on it, I found out that, that you know, these time um, changes, you know, they, they, um, it is, they are like just beside us, you know, they are, they are not far away from us. It's just some, it's all here, here where we are. There's all these things. And then I, from there, I was, then I started to understand what I have uh, experienced as a, a young child, you know, when I was eight years old, where I some, suddenly saw through, the veil was lifted and I saw the, the ethereal um, reality, like a night, light of net, that was kind of where the physical reality was actually hanging on, like without the etherical net, there would be no physical reality. And of course, as eight years old and later on 10 and 12 years old, I was not able to reflect on that or understand it. It was very frightening for, for, for a young child at that age. But now, so many years later, I suddenly start to understand that when you go into a deep, deep, uh, meditation. And mind you, I've, I've really worked with this uh, chair of fire for many years before I went there and actually did it in the cave. And I always thought that when you go to a holy place, wherever it is, of course it is powerful for anybody who goes there. But I've never really uh, practiced there so intense as I did this time, and in this place, in the cave number four, the the cave of the the cave of, of hope or the cave of light. So I started to connect everything that after what that happened to me afterwards, and which I'm writing in the book. I started to understand that this was all due to that practice done there, and I. I think that you can do this anywhere, actually. But something happened to me there that was really, really helping me because I think I needed this experience in order to write about it because I've been really going round and round it for many, many years without reaching the center of the circle. And I have a strong feeling that that was happening to me there the masculine and the feminine were also merging there, right there. And what is happening when, when you are leaving the intellect? Because the intellect is a control center, and there's nothing wrong with it as such, because without it, I could not sit here and, and speak with you and, and share this with you, and you would not be able to receive it. But when you go into, uh, start to practice things, you know, this is not something you don't need that control center anymore you you need to go back and become a child again as we are told in the new testament meaning that you are totally innocent you go into a, a part of you that is totally pure totally innocent don't know anything about control and don't want it you know it, it's it, you know when you're a child you don't want to be an adult before you go into your teens, then you want to be an adult. But as a child, you want to be in this innocence because everything is open to you. Now, as an adult, you start to work with these things and you go into the cave or you find your place and you start doing something that really means something to you, something that really is has something to do with you, you know, on a very, very deep level. And then things happened, and this is the experience of the book. 
but there's of course so much more to it because the while I was there before I went into the the practice before the film crew arrived the first day I arrived to Eastwood before the film crew came I went to the cave climbed up there sat there and meditated for 10 hours I fell asleep at one time and when I woke up I again had this feeling of information waiting for me and actually in the book I'm writing about the book of Asap who is a book in the book actually it's a metaphor for all that information that came in both before and after the the the, the practice and while I went there the first day on my own and meditated that was kind I understand now that was really my dedication that was my intentionally going there and saying openly I hereby declare myself that I will dedicate myself to this mission to this practice and it was a kind of prayer you know me crawling all up there and it's not an easy climb it's 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 a short, short climb but it's not easy it's really really it takes some effort you know so actually when the film crew were there and you cannot see it in the movie but i was actually about to fall down there it's 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 cut out of the movie because it doesn't look very very um elegant in any way but it was you really have to so if you're going on that trip and you want to crawl up there because it's the only way to enter it now because you're not allowed to go from the from the ruins because that's in in the area of the museum so you should be really be careful and really really be pre prepared for what you're doing but anyway when you do such a thing and you know why you're doing it you want really you don't you know you have to go there have in mind also what carol clark the wealthy had told me that this was uh, as something that was waiting for me to do you know um, so I knew it was a challenge on on more than one level it was not only a physical thing crawling up there but it was why do you want to go there I had that really in mind it was a question that was following me all the way and I, I, I remember I felt this um, really I was not scared, but I had this really tense feeling, you know, because I knew this is now. I had been going up there before, two times before, but the first time on this trip, I knew, okay, I will take it upon me and go up there. The reason why I'm telling you this now is that to me, this is re this was really a um, uh, to me an experience that tells that if you go on a trip like that and if you really go deep find a place and go into the to the unprotected state how you can we do that for example where you are now i don't know where you are in england for example go out in in, in a beautiful countryside maybe and find uh in, during the summertime here it will be could be a perfect find a spot an elevated spot a hill or something where you can sit maybe for three days in a fast you can eventually you can also for example bring a small tent in if it should start to rain or the weather should change but make a circle of stones around you bring some water maybe some food or something and a book an inspirational book maybe a book of prayers that you you love bring it with you and sit in meditation and just sit there reading meditating on what you read do some praying go deep within and but before all this before you go into that state declare yourself why are you going there what do you want to connect to is there something that you need an answer to that really means something? You know, it's not, of course, it's, 
if you play around with tarot, tarot cards, for example, I think this is not something you should do on an everyday level. I do it once a year. If I have, an, it will be around the new year, if maybe twice a year, if I have a really something, not because I want an answer from it, but I want to connect to the book of life. It will bring me in the right direction if I haven't got time to sit for three days, for example. But usually I would, if I wanted to connect to the book of life, I would go around the thing for some time. I would know that it would, I would have to bypass all the noise within me. The intellect who knows everything and is so clever, you know, and know exactly what kind of answer it wants. So if it wants, know what it wants, why should I go and get an answer if I know the answer? No, I want to bypass that control center in order to go to the genuine true world of answers. So that is why doing uh, spiritual work. And the seer, for example, he every morning he started to, to, to pro proclaim himself. He said, I hereby dedicate myself to the universe. And it was, I mean, in the beginning, I, did, I absolutely did not understand what he was about. But later on, I found out, wow, it is so strong, you know, and of course, it can be, in the beginning, it, it can be uh, awkward to do it, you know, because... But one has to do it. You have to go in there and you have to, to be dedicated and be aware of why are you doing what you're doing. So this is very much what the book is about also. So the, the book of ASAP here came in with a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, information that you have to, to, work, to read about yourself in the book. I could go on talking about this book, of course, but I, I knew that before we did this today, I, this was something I wanted to communicate with you because I know this is something that interests a lot of people about the chair of the fire and the old capitalistic stuff that actually started in the Essene Mystery School. Now I want to, to, to uh, leave time for if anybody has any questions towards all this or anything. But what I wanted to say was this has and you must read about it in the book yourself. I was connected also to my feminine, um, I would not say counterpart, but my feminine um, alter ego or principle that all males are carrying within. But mind you, it has, for all males, it has a personal, uh, it, it has a personal shape name and, and voice and it goes also of course for, for for the feminine for women they have a masculine voice and that is what we are calling soulmates or or all these uh, fancy titles but it is actually the the opposite of the if you are you're a woman it will be the opposite of what you are uh, so yeah this is also something you can read about in the book that I think it's very, very important to when we go into work like the chair of fire. Yeah, as a, you know, he he was a man of um, he haven't read anything really. He was uh, he was a practitioner who right from from his young days uh, were connected. You know, he was like, he, he, he was the one who fell into the soup very, very early on and uh, were able to connect to the Book of Life. And of course, in the beginning, he did not know what it was. And, but later on, when he found out, he became um, a healer, uh, a nature practitioner, and later on, uh, a seer. And that was when I met him, he got me out of bed. I was, had been laying on a bed for three years, uh, 
without getting any diagnosis, nobody could help me. And he helped me over the telephone, like he helped so many people every day uh, on his telephone when they called him from all over the world. So that was also my connection to him. But um, I was, I started to work with him uh, and became his apprentice or his pupil, and we worked together for nine years until his death in 2007. I have written about it in my, my book, The O Manuscript, and uh, the books, the three books, The Seer, The Magdalene, and The Grail. He's in both The Seer, of course, and also a part of the, the Mary Magdalene book. But um, yeah, what kind of man was it? He was a man with, with, with opposites, you know, many opposites, because at the same time he was able to, as I told you before, that he was struggling with his own problem and his own personality. He was able to leave all that behind every morning when he went into the office and helped people. So that was very helpful for me. And at the time I did not know that this was something that came in handy when I started to be more and more conscious about what I had realized already as a young child, but was not able to, 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 um, to reflect about and really understand. So it was through the work with him that I understood my own connection and how to go about it. But it took some time because he was a man of few words, so you just had to follow him and to to see what he was doing and and listen what he was talking, uh, telling people when he was doing his work. But um, yeah, he was a very, very charismatic and uh, amazing personality and uh, he surely missed but uh, he um, he was going on to to continue his work from the other side where he's still working and uh, so that's in short what it's all about but if you want to know more about it i think you should read the old manuscript the book you see here where he was where it's all about it you know That that Mandela is actually made out from the twenty-two letters in the Aramaic and Hebrew um, alphabet, and if you remember that it is said in the Kabbalistic and uh, Matic places uh, or uh, circles, and way back from the the Old Testament, that God created everything or the universe through the twenty-two uh, letters in the Aramaic. Uh, alphabet. And this uh, mandala is actually, the, there's 22 points around here, and this mandala is made of all the connections that are to these uh, 22 letters. The 22 letters of the alphabet is also part of the, the 22 path on the Kabbalistic tree between the 10 Sephi roads. There is 22 paths. And this is those paths that make up this uh, mandala. And this is just showing us how the light of the night, the net of light in the etherical is, and it absolutely looks what I saw as an eight year old when it opened up just for a split second. And I saw through my sister and the, the furniture in the, in, in the room where I was living at that time as a child with my parents. And later on, um, as it has shown in, in visions and meditations and so forth, in fact, when you do the fire of chariot practice. So that's why it's, it's on the cover of the book because that plays a very important role in the book also. There's also the story about the <clears throat> the rabbi Kaduri that became 106 years old and and uh, his connection to the vision of Yeshua that in his visions where he said this this Messiah is already here and he's here in Israel and but you know it's it's an amazing story because this is also some of the the very very interesting 
um, science, spiritual science that's taking place within Israel today that not very many people are, are, are aware of. You know, the, the hidden codes in the Bible and all this stuff. The, I know there have been a very, some very popular books that is absolutely have nothing to do with what I'm talking about here. But there is a science that's going on where they are looking up for seven hidden uh, codes in the Bible. And mind you, those codes, uh, you should imagine that they were written about somebody who was at the same time writing the stories of the Bible and at the same time applying seven different layers lying behind, seven other stories lying behind that story that we know if that we have heard about, for example, King Salomon and King David and, and um, you know, all those stories. Behind all of them, there are seven layers of uh, codes. And uh, right now, some of the rabbis I've met, they are telling me that they are sitting with very, very um, advanced computer programs because that's the only way you can really get to them. Unless, of course, you are totally uh, able to, to open to that higher consciousness of yours and mine and everybody else that are able to connect to that level. But it takes certain frequencies. And that is another thing about this book, that the, the first message I got from that book of ASAP or from the book of life is, you need to understand everybody here on the earth level need to understand you are already enlightened. And to me that came as not a shock, but as really a revelation because I also thought that, okay, now I've been studying, doing all this studying and I've been doing, trying to do practices in order to become enlightened. But that now I understand, you know, we are already enlightened. Why? Because we were born in the image of God. That is one of the codes of the Bible, saying that we are carrying the DNA of God or the spiritual DNA of God within us. So how do we connect to that? How do we find that frequency that connects to that image of God? And see, that comes handy in now because that now I understand why I was drawn to study the Aramaic language of Yeshua uh, 30 years ago, because you need to understand the Aramaic language in order to understand what Yeshua is talking about when he's saying in the New Testament, the kingdom of heaven is within you. And it, it, there's a connection right there, way back to the, the, the Genesis, the book of Genesis in the Old Testament, where we are told that God created man in his image. How should we understand it? We cannot. Only if we understand Malkuta de Shemaya, which means kingdom of God. If we, if I'm saying to you now in English, kingdom of God, okay, it sounds very good, but what is it? it, it what is the frequency? It's all in the air, man. The frequency take you right into that kingdom or into that seed of loving light, in, into the I am that all of us are carrying within. And it actually said that in the Aramaic, Malkuta Deshem Aya, Aya means which is forever. So it is something within us that is forever. When we leave this body, the soul and this seed of light, which means consciousness, it just travels on and you have all your experiences with you and you come back in a new incarnation, maybe not on the earth plane, you can go anywhere. You can go on in, in another galaxy, on another frequency, on another plane, because as we are told in the New Testament, my father's kingdom has many mansions. There's many, many, many different levels of consciousness to be reborn on, you know? So maybe it's your first time here on the earth level. So you could ask yourself a very, very um, 
important question. Why are you here now? Why are we here on the earth plane? And this is something that I've really, really been thinking about. There's lots of spiritual people that think, oh, we want to go away. We, why are we here? We don't, we don't fit in here. We want to be somewhere else. But there is, it's not coincidental that you are here. And that is all in this. If you would take, um, take a look at this and start to meditate on this and start to dig into what the Book of Asaf are told, telling about this, you would get a deeper understanding of why you are here and what, because you should imagine what you are right now is, is the essence of all the life you have been living. So what is Earth all about? Earth about is about manifestations. It is to become from spirit, you become a physical being. You're still spirit first and foremost, but now you find yourself caught up a prisoner in a physical body. Why should that, why should you? There is a purpose, of course. We are here to learn to manifest. And before we can manifest, we will need to know why, what would, would be not just to manifest anything. It is the manifestation of spirit into matter. Because this is, we need, to, we are here in order to, to experience something that we can take from this level of, of consciousness to another level when we, we leave. We are here to learn something, but also to share something. So it's really, really exciting, I think. And, um, but I must also admit, before I understood this, I also often had this already from when I was a child, what am I doing here? Because I've already, as a young person, I found that this was a very primitive place. So, of course, later on, it's, it, there is a reason for you being here. And this is something we should all understand, you know, and really find out that when we leave, we don't die, you know, it's only the, the physical body that goes, but we go on, you know. We, we have only one life, but it is forever. There's appearances, and then we step back, then we come, you know, again and again and again. And every time, hopefully, on a higher level. Sometimes when we reach a bodhisattva kind of space or frequency, we will go back because we are needed to do work. So there are actually bodhisattvas around here that comes and goes and and it can be the beggar on the corner just outside your home. We don't know, and it doesn't matter, you know, because it's all part of the, the amazing thing about being here right now. So you should always, uh, you should never be downhearted or sad or anything, because if you start to investigate who you really are and why you are here, it all changes. Doesn't mean that you, you won't have sad days or you would have be frustrated or something, but you would easily and very quickly come back on the horse, so to speak, and start to um, to do what you came here to do. Sorry for the long answer, but nothing. Um, it needed this answer, I think, in order to explain why this mandala is on the front part. I hope it's 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 satisfying. It is actually online. You can find it on gilalai.com and I think it can be streamed there for a reasonable price, very, very cheap, uh, for a few quid. Uh, and it's only the money goes to the administrator who is administering the showing of the film. So it is actually there. It, it came out uh, last week and it's, it is in English and in Danish. So, uh, and it's actually Michael Mann, a former uh, uh, editor of Watkins Books or Publishing, that is narrating it together with me. me. So it's there. Go to gilalai.com.
I think a, a lot of people who go there, uh, Christians and, and people alike, they, if you're very sensitive, you, you will feel it immediately. And that is why we have the Jerusalem syndrome, because people, they, would, they, they are elevated back to maybe a former lifetime. I, you know, sometimes there's more than one Jesus walking around in a, in a, in a robe and some sandals with long hair and, and beards and stuff and, and a, a, a stick, you know. Um, you know, this is amazing, you know. And some of them, they, they are transported to a hospital in Jerusalem where they actually have a department for that kind of thing, where they help people to get out of that syndrome. Uh, but it happens now and again. Uh, to me, for me, it was very, very powerful also, always powerful to go there because I, that's what how I feel it, you know. I'm, I'm not stepping into Israel today. I'm stepping into a thousand year old past of mine uh, that we go way back, way, way back, even before time and space, you know, every, before everything was created, really. There is um, visions that, that really are connected to, to that place that later become, became Israel and the Holy Land. But I think everybody who goes there will feel this somehow, in one way or the other, no doubt about it. And it is, it is because there's so much um, gathered in, in Jerusalem. There's all kinds of traditions there. Just remember there's Sufis, there's all those different Christians, there's Muslims, there's um, old, old mystery schools, remnants from old mystery schools, people who are, to, who are practicing all kinds of stuff, you know, and Kabbalistic stuff. I, I've met rabbis there who are really into some uh, interesting stuff that you won't find anywhere on the internet or they are not interested in sharing this with anybody because they know that putting it out there would just distort it in some way. And this is, this is one of the things that I always as an author and uh, uh, that I feel as a scribe is my job to balance things, you know, because you, you, you need to really be genuinely true to what you're doing. If you start to, 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 to put in stories that is not really truthful, you know, or try to make, um, uh, you know, to make sensational stuff or something, you should know why you're doing this. It's not, and I think this is something all writers, all people who are into what I'm doing should, should really work with that also. But this is something I also work with because sometimes it's hard to find words for something. How do you describe things in a way that people will not just say, ah, this man is crazy or, or whatever. You know? So it's, it's just very much to do with that also. But, but Jerusalem, it opens up for, for so many things. It's the key to understand anything of what Yeshua is really saying, you know. And the moment that you really get it, you, you start to wonder why, how that could go on for so many years, you know, that, that people are not told the truth about these things. And because, but luckily now, I found out that there were actually people who were doing it, you know, but there were very few. And there was also people who were really sensational, who was trying, as I was saying before, who wanted to take it, you know, when they just, oh, we must take that and throw it into, you know, the secret of this and the secret of that. But this, the secret is actually just, there is a key that you haven't been told or shown before. That's the only secret. As soon as you have the, the key, there's no secrets anymore. And you should imagine when Jesu was talking, he said, let those who have ears hear and those who have eyes see. And he was really pointing to, we need to understand this on a higher and deeper level, you know. And, and uh, 
Yeah. Just think about what you just said there with Napsia. Jesu is actually saying in the New Testament here, as a person, a city, a nation who are not in alignment with his, hers, its own Napsia, cannot exist. Meaning that you are actually half alive. You are not really alive before you come to awareness that every time you bypass your own purpose in this life, you are not alive. So it is said in the New Testament for Christ's sake that we need to wake up and start to find out why are we, we are not here just to, to see one Netflix series after the other. Of course, it's all right to do, but there's more to life than just entertainment and just, and I think within the, the spiritual community also, there's so much of this going on. People want to have experiences, but on a, on a kind of sensational way. They want to take part of this, the, 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 the experience, but not really doing the work in order to go there, you know? So there's a lot of what I call spiritual tourism going on. Um, that we can go and, and, and connect to this or that in a weekend. We can, but we need to, to be very clear minded about why are we doing it? Why would we like to do it? Why would, would, would I like to, to, to do this practice of the, the chair and the fire, for example? Or why should I want to, to, to do uh, uh, that kind of yoga? Uh, or, you know, is because we are here not for our own sake only. We are also here to share and care about other people. That's a very, very important, for, to me, it's a very important part of being in the incarnate now on the earth plane. Uh, and I think everybody should find out their own um, purpose in this life through this. I don't know of the sound, of course, because, you know, when we are doing these kind of things, uh, the sound can be disturbing, you know? Very short version here. But it is a meditative thing that you will continue and continue, as you can see in the video, The Gate of Light. Where you say, Bishem Adonai, Bishem Adonai, Mi Ameni Mikhae, Mi Ameni Mikhae, O Mi Snoli Gabriye, O Mi Snoli Gabriye, O Mi Lefanai Uriye, O Mi Lefanai Uriye, O me acho a Rafael, O me acho a Rafael, Me a Rossi se quinai, O me lefana, Me para 
for now, I think. Come to me here in the monastery in Aarhus. I will come to, um, uh, I will go to England and uh, do stuff there. And I, I always uh, love to go to, ever since when I was in a, in a band, when I was going to London to record and something, way back in the ages. Now, when I come and do spiritual work in, in College of Psychic Studies or in St. James Church or in the shop where I also, I always love to come there. So hopefully I will see you soon over there. Thank you for having me and take care over there. I will visit you next time. There's so many books I want to look at. <laughs>